Yo, this is Ben Cubbage from Elevated Trips, and today we're exploring the Jokong Temple. So, actually, I'm not looking at the Jokong Temple right now, but I'm standing on top of the, the Barkor Square area. And uh, the Jokong Temple is the holiest temple in Tibetan Buddhism. In uh, 640 AD, Princess Wenshang ventured from the capital of China, which was then Chang'an, uh, currently known as modern day Xi'an, and she made a three year journey on her horseback to marry King Songsen Gampo, the king of Tibet at that time. She traveled to Lhasa, where I'm standing right now, the capital of Tibet, and she married King Songsen Gampo. And as a marriage gift, she gave him a Buddha that was a Buddha statue that was dated back to roughly around the time of the original Buddha, which means it was from around 500 BC. Because of the age, and likeness of it to the original Buddha, it's actually considered the holiest statue in all of Tibet. And for that reason, that is the statue inside the Jokong Temple. And the Jokong Temple is also the holiest temple in Tibet. Certainly not the biggest, but as far as pilgrimage and importance, it's kind of the Mecca of Tibet. And uh, that's what Lhasa represents for all Tibetans, is kind of the holy land or a place of promise for attaining merit and good karma for the next life. And that's why many Tibetans make a pilgrimage here. One experience that you just gotta try, you'll probably get a little bit ripped off as a foreigner, but it's still really fun, is this rickshaw driving. So my driver, I have a little bicycle guy here and he's driving bicycle and I'm in the back in a little cart and he's just kind of cart me through the streets of Lhasa. Okay, this is it. This is the super exciting energy that you really want to feel when you reach Lhasa. All the pilgrims are, are out. There's thousands of pilgrims walking this morning. They're spinning their prayer beads. They're saying their prayers and their mantras. And they're all here for this one temple, the Jokong Temple. And that is what we're walking right now. We're walking the Barkor Circuit, which is sort of the one kilometer pilgrimage around the temple that people will walk. Sometimes they'll walk at one time, three times, maybe even 108 times, they'll circle this temple. And it's all about achieving merit and good works to visit the holiest temple in Tibet, which is right behind me right here. The devotion of the Tibetan Buddhist people is really unrivaled in most other religions. You can see here there's hundreds of people just out in the courtyard of the Jokong Temple and they're all bowing down, prostrating in front of the temple. So there's people that prostrate here, uh, and they'll, they'll take a step, they'll prostrate, and they'll take a step and prostrate. And that's how people move oh. through and to the Jokong. There's also people here that'll take a step, prostrate in the north, east, south, west direction, and then take another step. So it's uh, pretty amazing. Got a little friend here. Mm. 
so we're inside the Jokong Temple here, the holiest temple on the Tibetan Plateau. We're on the second floor, uh, so we're actually allowed to take videos in this courtyard area, looking down into the Jokong Temple. There's thousands of pilgrims that visit this place every day. It'll walk 1,000, 2,000, sometimes even 3,000 kilometers to get here. So when you enter Jokong Temple as the holiest temple in all of Buddhism, you can expect a lot of crowds. And not just pilgrims, there's local Chinese tourists, there's foreign tourists. So when you get inside, it does have a very holy and old and authentic feel, but there are a lot of people and you can expect to be very, very crowded by lots of lines of people. You probably have to wait 10, 15, 20 minutes just to wait in line for the ticket. And then once you're inside, it's a very small space with a lot of people. So if you're not into big crowds and being crowded, I'd say, you know, maybe skip this one. But as far as the importance of Tibetan Buddhist temples, it is uh, definitely number one and definitely worth uh, a full morning or afternoon, half day visit to the Jokong Temple. Woo! Day two. Woke up this morning. Didn't sleep so well because of the altitude. Also just drinking a ton of Indian masala tea, which is very caffeinated. But this is the view from the top of our hotel. And uh, this is just incredible. The Batala Palace is behind us. We can't see it because it's kind of blocked by some, some of those wood piles. But yeah, this is the view from the Barkor area around the Jokong Temple in the morning. the local Tibetan market where they're selling lots of jewelry. You really have anything you want to buy. I mean, anything from super cheap shoes to Tibetan artifacts, old furniture. If you're looking for Tibetan rugs, prayer beads, anything around Buddhism or Tibetan culture, this is a great place to find it. And these people have come from all over Tibet, not just Lhasa area, but from Kham Tibet, Amdo Tibet, all parts of the Tibetan plateau. And they're all here for one reason, which is to walk this beautiful square and to worship at this particular monastery. So really cool to be here and just love being out here in the morning.
We find there's a lot of new tea houses and coffee shops springing up around the Lhasa Barkor area. Uh, most of the food you'll find here is going to be Chinese style food mixed with Tibetan food. I uh, highly recommend the Tibetan Family Kitchen. If you are walking through the Barkor and spending a few days here in Lhasa, they have probably the best Momo in town. And Momo is a, uh, a dumpling with yak meat inside of it. And um, yeah, there's also a mix of Indian restaurants, Chinese restaurants, hot pot. I mean, anything you're really looking for, it's here. You can, you can eat pretty diversely for at least three or four days and then uh, move on to Shirgatse and Everest Base Camp if you choose to leave Lhasa. Surrounding the Barkor Square is this labyrinth of alleys that sort of winds in and out. It's often difficult to, f to find where you're going because all these alleys, as you can see behind me, just sort of intertwine and connect like, like a maze. And so uh, definitely easy to get a little bit lost back here. So for your first or second day, make sure you're with your guide. You'll probably get your bearings over two or three days in Lhasa as you climb ties, but make sure you get, uh, figure it out. After a couple laps around the Barcourt Square, we're gonna hit the Summit Cafe. This is American owned and started cafe, probably the best coffee shop in Lhasa, in my opinion. And uh, it's right off the Barcour Square and a good place to get a cup of coffee in Lhasa after walking the Barcour a few times. We're here at Lhasa Airport and it actually just started hailing. This huge hailstorm. Storm just broke out behind us. And uh, this is the first time in really three years that Lhasa is actually open to foreigners. There's a month or two during COVID where foreigners could actually come in, but essentially it's really been closed since about February, March, 2020. And so this is a big deal. I'm probably one of the first foreigners to be walking inside of Lhasa Airport and getting out of Lhasa Airport and doing the trip to Everest Base Camp. So that's pretty exciting. And we're excited for uh, China to be opening up, Tibet to be opening up and travel permits to be issued again after almost three years where people haven't had any work and the tourism industry has just grinded to a halt down here. So it's nice to see people getting back to work and things getting back to normal. <laughs> 